Hello everyone, today I'm really excited to have a special guest on the show. Her name is Kat Green. She is a the only board certified child psychologist in the state of Utah and she specializes in OCD, ADHD, learning di- disorders, and is really experienced in dealing with OCD and intrusive thoughts. So today we're going to be asking her your questions about intrusive thoughts. And just so you know, um, Kat and I have worked together to build a course on intrusive thoughts. It's on my website and you can find more information in the link in the description, but it goes through the four main steps of knowing what to do with intrusive thoughts because intrusive thoughts can feel scary. They can feel a little bit overwhelming. So check out the link in the description if you'd like to learn more about uh, Kat's course on uh, how to take charge of intrusive thoughts. Okay, well, let's get to these questions. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for taking the time to teach us all about intrusive thoughts. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. We asked for some questions and got a lot of them. Do you want to start with some of these really basic ones, the most common ones? Yeah, by far the most common were were the questions that actually that the course is kind of intended to address. And hopefully people got answers to those questions as they went through. But I mean, the big question of kind of what are intrusive thoughts, right? Like, what does that encompass? And in in the course, we talk through images, thoughts, videos, words, they can come in lots of different forms, but just things that they're uninvited. They, in, they're, we call them intrusive because they intrude on your life, right? They come out of the blue sometimes and they're just associated with a lot of distress, right? They're just really uncomfortable and bothersome. A lot of people ask kind of what causes them but especially like, why me? Like, Why are they so prevalent for me? And I talked through in the course that everyone, almost everyone endorses yeah. having intrusive thoughts, even similar content kind of across the board, but there's a number of factors that make them sticky. So people who tend to have higher anxiety, certainly if they kind of run in the OCD realm, those thoughts get stuck for a number of reasons. Part of it is kind of neurobiological, kind of predisposed to it. They get more thoughts. They're just stickier thoughts to begin with. But usually intrusive thoughts go after what people value, what they care about. So if you really care about something, then the the idea of violating a rule around that is just horrifying. And so then it kind of starts this, this cycle of, wait, why did I have that thought? What must it mean? We've talked about this before. And so that kind of grows those intrusive thoughts over time. And then, of course, the big question for everyone was, what do I do about them? Right, like how do I make them stop, right? Yes, how do I make them stop and go away? And, you know, the delightful answer in the course is you don't. But the good news is we can make them less scary and less sticky. And eventually they do kind of learn to wax and wane and they just don't disrupt your life as much. And I, I talk about kind of, four steps, right? So identifying and labeling it first, which is harder to do than it seems. Some of the questions talked about like in the moment, you know, how do I know if it's intrusive or not? I often tell people, try and experiment. If it feels scary to call it intrusive, try it, <laughs> see what happens, right? If you're because it, it's, it's yeah. like, oh, but maybe if I don't listen this time, something terrible really will happen. So the first thing you're doing is labeling and saying, I think that's an uninvited guest. I, mm-hmm. I don't I don't think I that's something I invited here. I think it's one of those intrusive thoughts. And then I always encourage people to figure out what does the thought or the feelings that come with it, what do they want? And almost always they want people to avoid or they want people yeah. to engage with them, kind of leave mm-hmm. their own life and what matters to them to totally focus on that thought or feeling. Mm-hmm. And then you have to be able to take a step back and say, okay, what do I want in this moment? In the course, I talk about kind of being at life as a party and you're kind of engaging the activities and the relationships and the goals that you want. You just, you can't force those thoughts back out the door, but as you kind of engage in your life, as you identify your goals, kind of that last step is saying, okay, I'm going to take the step. I'm going to move towards my goal, even though this intrusive thought's going to come kicking and screaming and complaining and tantruming. It's going to follow me around for a while but still being willing to move towards that goal kind of, and maybe small steps at a time. Yeah. Oh, that's a great summary. Okay. One of the questions that came up a lot for our audience is are intrusive thoughts caused by or associated with trauma? So Fiore says, is there a connection between intrusive thoughts and trauma? 
even though the thought that comes up is not directly related to the traumatic experience? Why does this happen? Yeah, so there are a number of questions related to just do they come from trauma or is it childhood trauma or these kind of things? It depends. That's like the famous fun answer. The truth (laughs) is most of the time they don't, right? Most of the time they're not related to some specific past event or some specific trauma. If we're talking about kind of broad intrusive thoughts as a a group, there's kind of two caveats there. I mean, one is in something like post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's obviously associated with a specific trauma, people with PTSD do experience intrusive thoughts often directly related to an accident or a military action or something like that, that they are related to that trauma, but most people can see the, the connection there. And generally kind of childhood trauma or trauma in general, it does elevate your risk for kind of lots of things right? It does Mm -hmm. increase anxiety, depression, intrusive thoughts kind of across the board, but it's typically not like a one-to-one ratio of here's, here was the trauma and here's what's upsetting. Well, yeah, because trauma increases kind of people's overall anxiety and hypervigilance, right? So they're going to be a little bit more sensitive maybe to intrusive thoughts or to anxiety in general. And that's one of the things that can cause that intrusive thought cycle to spiral. Yeah. And it could, I mean, we just have lots of, lots of data that, you know, trauma can also just interrupt developmental processes and figuring out how to process those, like you were saying, kind of sensitivity. So we do see that. And in some ways the treatment is similar and in some ways different, right? Like with trauma, you do some kind of body calming and facing and and reprocessing those memories, but with with intrusive thoughts, it's different. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you're to your spot. So the treatment for trauma, I mean, trauma focused cognitive behavior therapy, it's looking at the same things for its intrusive thoughts. There's an element of it there. There's some things that we do a little bit differently. If I'm working with kids or young adults who've experienced trauma, I do approach it slightly differently, but more in kind of how I set things up. I'm sensitive to to that specific event. And I'm aware of that as we're working through those, those specifics. But the the fundamental process, right? Those four steps as you go, go through this course are actually very similar. Yeah. So to deal with the intrusive thoughts specifically, the approach is, is pretty similar across the board. But like you said, in, in trauma work, in the case of PTSD, you are going to address a few things and just be sensitive to that. And obviously it depends on the age of the person you're working with and things like that too. Yeah, for sure. Great. Okay. You ready for the next one? I'm ready. Okay. So a lot of people ask, how do you deal with intrusive thoughts that are based in an actual problem or a real threatening situation in the past? So this comes up often, especially related to to trauma. And in my general work with exposure therapy and anxiety disorders, you know, a lot of anxiety is related to actual threat and then that system being completely hijacked. Right. Right. So I've, I've worked with a lot of kids who you know, have OCD and it's contamination related, these intrusive thoughts about getting sick or vomiting may be associated with in the past getting sick and vomiting, right? Right. So these are, part of it is kind of understanding if it's one of these unpleasant events or if it's an actually threatening event in the past, Mm -hmm. right? If it's one of these really unpleasant things that we went through and don't want to go through again, but it's not like physically harmful to us. Versus, like, like, know, I, like vomiting is really embarrassing, really uncomfortable, really awful, but it's not actually dangerous. And right. Like, thinking about vomiting isn't actually going to hurt you. Like that thought is not going to hurt you. Right. right. Yeah. And I, so I think that's, and that's a lot of the, a lot of the cases in intrusive. Let's see. That's a lot of the time, kind of what we're looking at with intrusive thoughts. Is it something that, it is embarrassing or really unpleasant um, or scary, but it's not a situation that's kind of life-threatening. That's when we kind of move into this PTSD group. There is this group in the middle. I've, I've worked with young adults before that have intrusive thoughts about being bullied or attacked, concerned about being transgender, right? And going to a big public university and being afraid of being confronted or challenged. And part of what we yeah. do is we, we practice, right? We practice how you'd respond and we face those fears but at some point, there's also actual safety training, right? Mm-hmm. This is when there's actually a threat. This is when you should not hold your ground, 
if if there's an actual physical threat or danger, we have to talk about those cues as well, right? So mm-hmm. it's in those situations, we're just, it's working with people to say, okay, what what do you want your life to look like? How do we live it? And then where are the boundaries that we need to be aware of, you know, where we actually move into physical danger? Yeah, yeah. Because, because it, like disordered anxiety at its essence is like feeling in danger when you're actually safe. And so there is a non-disordered anxiety that's like feeling in danger when you're actually in danger and that you shouldn't be like, oh, I need to soothe my anxiety. It's more like, oh, right. I need to choose to like escape or fight off my attacker or hide or something mm-hmm. like some action instead of like, oh, I need to make this anxiety go away. And then there's this middle ground of like acceptable risk of like, oh, yeah. like living my life involves risk. So will I accept that driving occasionally has some danger involved, right? And will I choose to drive anyway, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I think it's particularly difficult for people that experience a lot of anxiety or intrusive thoughts. That middle ground is hard, right? Because, you know, your brain is kind of operating from a side of overvigilance, that over threat you're talking about, and you know that, but then you're kind of, it, it takes some time and some practice really to try to push beyond that and say, okay, I think this is an acceptable threat given all, you know, all, everything I know, this is what I want to move towards in my life. I think that middle ground is particularly scary for people yeah. that are, tend to be overly anxious because you have to be willing to hope, right? Be willing to hope that everything you're thinking is right, right? That it's like, yeah. okay, I think this is going to be fine. And there's, mm-hmm. you just, you have to try it. Right. Yeah. And and with exposure therapy or trying it, right, facing it, if you really consistently do that, the anxiety generally goes down, right? Generally. Our goal Not is always. to move them to yeah, your goal is to move move you towards just being able to live your life. Usually yeah. it goes down. For some people it sticks around. Mm-hmm. So some people still feel a lot of anxiety or they might have a lot of intrusive thoughts, but at least their quality of life's better because they're living the way they want to be living. They're not letting anxiety make their choices. Yeah. That's right. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So here's the next question. What does the content of intrusive thoughts mean about me? And then people asked other follow-up questions. Is it related to unmet needs or does the content point to an underlying issue? I think this is a really common question that a lot of people have, right? Yes. And we're both smiling because we've had this, this discussion where, you know, if you've gone through the course, you, you know, we've, I talk about this meaning making is actually one of the most effective strategies that anxiety uses, right? Instead of, you know, anxiety bursts into the scene, a party crasher shows up and it's like, oh my gosh, something terrible is going to happen, right? You're going to stab someone. And then Mm -hmm. you're like, oh my gosh, why do I feel so anxious? And somehow it's amazing. Instead of the party crasher being like, because I showed up and screamed at you, Mm -hmm. the party crasher is like, it's because you're a bad person. Right. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're right. I am a bad person, right? It's this, it's a very effective strategy. It gets you focused on, oh my goodness, what this, you know, could mean about me and my existence and humanity. Mm -hmm. And then it it completely sidesteps being like, wait a minute, (laughs) something about that intrusive thought doesn't totally ring true. So this, this is why we're smiling, right? Is this, what does it, what does it mean about me? And this is, you'll, you'll see this in the course having intrusive thoughts doesn't mean really anything about you. It makes you a human. Having more intrusive thoughts might mean that you have a little more anxiety, but the content Mm -hmm. specifically is often related to, you know, things that you value. So they scare you, right? So things that, you know, I have worked with a lot of folks that are, you know, physicians and they're really worried about physical health. And so their intrusive thoughts take on the form of, you know, getting fears of getting sick or getting cancer or getting respiratory illness, right? And it does, yeah. it's not just physicians, but people in general, like I, I often see this kind of grouping, right? I work with people who just love spending time with, with family and all they want to do is kind of be the best parent they could be. And they have these intrusive thoughts about hurting their kids, right? Or these intrusive thoughts about being attracted to kids and it just scares them to death. Mm-hmm. So the content of the thoughts you know, what it, what people often feel like is it means that they're just like a terrible person. And what it right. often just means is it, it's something that scares you because it's related to something important to you. And for some people, they really don't like, they're like, I don't know why that's what bugs me. So one of the things that we, we both kind of try to do is move away from 
spending a lot of time in the corner at the party talking about why that intrusive thought's there and why that Mm -hmm. specific one and why you and spending more time being like, hmm, yep, there they are. And then trying to move towards kind of what you care about. Yeah. So, so your advice would be, I mean, these intrusive thoughts, like a party crusher, they come in and they're like, oh my gosh, you are a pedophile, for example. (laughs) Right. I've worked with clients who had that thought. And, and then because that thought brings anxiety, someone might make this meaning. They might think, oh, if I had this thought, what if it's true? And then they feel even more anxiety, which tells their brain, oh, this thought's really important, which makes this thought louder. And, And what you're saying is really like, if someone's bothered by a thought, it might, it might say something about, it might not always say something about their values. Like you care about kids or you care about keeping people safe, but it might not mean anything. And spending a lot of time meaning making or trying to figure out what this means about you is actually just really not a very good use of energy. Well, and this is, I mean, this ties to a concept kind of, well, kind of within the anxiety literature, this concept of having a hard time tolerating uncertainty yeah. And so so that's one of the driving factors across any sort of anxiety is this intolerance of an uncertainty. And what happens with, with people that are more anxious, right? You have this thought come in and if you can't explain it, it's like, I, I just have to think it to death. I have to be able to explain it. I must be certain that I know where it came from and I can, I can trace it all the way back to the, you know, big bang. Like there's things that it just this need for certainty (laughs) to be absolutely sure that you know where it came from. So you know where it's going and you know what it means about you. Mm -hmm. And the truth is any of us with more anxiety are less comfortable with that uncertainty. Our threshold for that is like, not my favorite thing. And so particularly intrusive and in the world of intrusive thoughts, that tolerance of uncertainty comes up a lot in the literature and in treatment and just in people's general experience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me too. I hate uncertainty, <laughs> but I'm trying to be more willing to experience it, <laughs> which is hard. I know. I just want to know everything. Yeah, yeah. Be sure about it all. Is that too much right. to ask? <laughs> Probably not, but you know, <laughs> doesn't work too well, does it? I know. Yeah. All right. So, are intrusive thoughts symptoms of being stuck in the past? That's interesting. Yeah. So this comes, it's a, similar to kind of the trauma piece and trauma, some of the content piece. It, not necessarily. I mean, I, there are certain, sometimes if you're, if you're prone to intrusive thoughts, you might have memories that are sticky, just mm-hmm. like other thoughts, right? If you experience lots of social anxiety, it, you may remember all the embarrassing things that have happened and they seem to stick with you, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean it's, it's, unresolved, right? It means that that's, that's something that's hard for you and our negative memories encode more strongly than our positive memories. Yes. And so this is, this is one of these things that it, it probably doesn't mean that there's some unresolved thing in the past. It may, it might mean that you have an ongoing fear, mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily, I, I think there's some danger in spending all of your time trying to go back and figure out why instead yep. of saying, okay, well, maybe I'll figure that out. Maybe I won't. There's that uncertainty. But yeah. I, I'm going to move towards what I want now. Mm-hmm. Like there's this danger of getting stuck in overthinking and overanalyzing and trying to solve everything in your head so much so that you never take the question and say, well, what do I want to be doing moving forward? Yeah. How do I want to be call, living? I call it going down the rabbit hole, right? We yeah. just like, <laughs> I'll often just pull people right out of that. They're like, why? And I'm like, nope. Right. Right. Like we're just not, not going there. It's, it's just not, yeah. it, you know, it's like the epitome of having to sit with uncertainty because it's like, Maybe there's an answer, maybe there's not. But what most people find is as they put that on the shelf and they kind of tolerate that not knowing exactly, it gives them a lot more bandwidth to then try moving forward. And then most people gain some confidence and momentum and they may or may not figure out a lot of people as they go through these intrusive thoughts and work through treatment are like, oh, I can kind of see how that fits. And some people are like, I don't know why this happened to me. I don't know why this sticks but they feel way more able to say, but that's okay. I'm going to move on and here's what's next. And it doesn't haunt them in the same way. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. What are different ways people experience intrusive thoughts? Can they ever manifest as ticks, emotions, or sensations? Yeah, this was a great question. And I, I think particularly because I work with kids, I actually see a lot of tick disorders that are comorbid with OCD and ADHD 
those actually come together a lot. We call it the trifecta. There's actually a whole theme or kind of group in OCD called teretic OCD. So it's not necessarily that the thoughts come as ticks, but it's not uncommon for people to experience kind of a discomfort or urge, a feeling instead of an intrusive thought. And then that tick comes kind of close on its heels as more of a compulsion. It's also not uncommon at all for people with Tourette's or ticks to find that their their compulsions related to intrusive thoughts or their behaviors blend with ticks. I see that all the, there's a proposal to call them impulsions instead of compulsions. Hmm. Uh, But I, I work with this a lot. So it's, it's something that I see. It's not something that takes me by surprise. Again, it's not necessarily the intrusive thought that I see as a tick, but I can often see like an urge or just a discomfort that comes as intrusive and then a tick kind of follows. It's the same, I mean, absolutely intrusive feelings. For some people, they they have a hard time separating out the thought and the feeling. And I encourage people to work towards that. I think there's some some helpful insight there. But for, for some, they may just- You mean feel, like, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, you mean like you know, to clarify what, what, like to just be like, oh, what is my sensation? What is my thought? And make those two very like discrete things. Yes. And then for some people, it may not be as discrete, right? But it, what it helps kind of do is kind of set the whole, the whole stage. If you think about like intrusive thoughts as a party crasher, but if you're like, you know what, I really don't experience a thought. That's also fine. That doesn't skip. There's, there's very little, very little in the world of intrusive thoughts that surprises me. It could absolutely, if you think about a party crasher, it could absolutely be a sensation, right? Nausea is a common one. If you think of, and maybe it comes in this world of emetophobia, right? Being afraid of throwing up so that the nausea comes right with the thought of like, oh my gosh, I don't want to throw up. For some people, they may experience it. They may not know why panic attacks that come out of the blue. Mm -hmm. There, There usually are some thoughts kind of flying around there, which is usually, I don't want this to happen right? It's actually fear of the fear, which you've talked about, but absolutely the sensation can come first, right? So physical sensation or emotion, you know, whoever's kicking down the door at the party, it could definitely be any of those. So, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, it's like something kind of comes in and we experience randomness with our physical sensations. Like we might have just a little wave of nausea come in, or we might have like someone with a, a tick disorder might have this urge to clear their throat or someone might have a thought like, oh my gosh, what if I like do something really stupid or what if I hurt someone? And then the, the thing that's similar is that in all those cases, someone reacts to that with like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I felt that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I thought that. Or, oh, I have to clear my throat, right? Got to make this go away. Got to suppress it. Got to push it. Got to avoid it. Got to make a big deal of it, right? Yeah. And I mean, any of them are associated. And I I think tick disorders, it depends on if for people that experience an intrusive thought there, there's a group that feel like doing a tick helps Mm. make it seem less real or it it won't happen. So this is where it kind of blends into this teretic OCD. Ticks by themselves may not be associated with a lot of distress or fear. So this is where it it just kind of, it depends on the individual's experience, but absolutely with the sensations, right? For people that are really concerned about their their health, their panic disorder, they're constantly monitoring their body and they detect anything, like you said, these random sensations that we all have. And the body's like, oh my gosh, something's off. Oh my gosh, this means panic attack. Oh my, I mean, then it just kind of spirals from there. Yeah. Okay. So that trifecta you just described, OCD, ADHD, and tick disorder, those three, is there some sort of genetic or heritable component? What do we know about that? Yeah. So usually, I mean, all of those have a pretty strong heritable component. And so the, you see those genes kind of come together with some regularity. So yeah, I mean, there's certainly, it's often I I might be, you know, working with a a family and I know there's, you know, I know there's a history of OCD. I'm seeing the OCD symptoms. I'm hearing their school problems. Yeah. Right. And it can be due to OCD. Right. So it could certainly be due to intrusive thoughts. Right. I don't want to write because I, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm doing it right the first time and I have to rewrite and rewrite and erase. or I'm going to make a mistake. So it could be related to intrusive thoughts. But as I'm, I'm listening for other kind of things like, you know, getting disciplined or missing work or those things that may be more on the ADHD side and then ticks more often than not families will say oh yeah they when i kind of describe what they are oh yeah they do do that or you know we do have a family member that does that again it runs you know much more in men all all 
well, ADHD and tick disorders are much more common in men. And then OCD is kind of split between. Mm -hmm. We don't fully understand the genetic predispositions there. I mean, it's, it's not, there's not a single gene. This is complex, right? But it is more like when I look at someone with a, a case of OCD or family history of OCD in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this is slightly more heritable, slightly more probably genetically predisposed than something like anxiety or depression, which has slightly less heritability, right? Yeah, kind of, we call it specific heritability, right? So Mm -hmm. you've got OCD, it's, you know, in anxiety or depression, it may be social anxiety to, and then the next generation generalized anxiety. And then for kids, Mm -hmm. separation anxiety, right? It's kind of this anxious temperament um, that can take a lot of different diagnostic forms or kind of themes. Mm -hmm. OCD is a little bit more, OCD to OCD to OCD. That's not a, you know, it's not a perfect match. It's like you said, it's, it's complex and it's certainly not all heritable, but it's more likely that you'll see specific Mm -hmm. diagnoses of OCD, which when we talk about intrusive thoughts, all anxiety has some component of that intrusiveness, or a lot of people experience that OCD, the, the themes that I talk about in my course are much more common, you know, in OCD, kind of those groups of themes that we see. Yeah. And, and and that being said, even with there being a genetic component, there's also a psychological component. Like how when we change how we think and we change how we act, oh, absolutely, we can, like really impact how these evidence themselves, how they express, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of these that I you know I work with a long a lot of young adults, and they are in this stage and age where they're you know in relationships, and as they get into their kind of later 20s, they're thinking about kids. And I I have a lot of people like, oh my gosh, am I going to pass this to my kids? And it's like, well, yeah, you're going to pass your genes to your kids if they're your biological children. That's going to happen. But (laughs) it's it's in no means, you know, it's by no means like a a death sentence, right? It's not, this is something that you're aware of. You might watch for it, right? It it is slightly more likely, but it's certainly not a hundred percent. You know, if you have kids, your kids will definitely have OCD. And there's so many things that, you know, vary and affect whether or not OCD manifests and at what age yeah. and how severe it is. And the cool thing, like you're saying, is we can behaviorally intervene and adjust mm-hmm. those pathways, those kind of default pathways in the brain. They may experience more intrusive thoughts than other kids their age, right? Yeah. But you can also help them through it because that's mm-hmm. been a familiar experience. And in fact, there's a oh, question. Yeah, let's go into that. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, or yeah, I mean, we can talk about that more. But, yeah, yeah there, there's some questions about kind of how to help kids, you know, with intrusive thoughts. And I, I think this is something that if you've had them yourself, you're so sensitive to how scary and isolating they can be. And you just feel like, you know, either you're going crazy or no one understands, or you sound like a weirdo, right? Or you'll be arrested if you say any of these things. And I, I yeah. think, you know, having re- having done some work there, if you're a parent, kind of d- done your own work on those intrusive thoughts and found a, a way that you can walk through those four steps, right? And separate out and live your goals. You're such a great resource for your kid, right? To help them understand and I'm like, oh yeah, these are normal. You can kind of be this this sounding board where they can voice those, and you're not like giving them a ton of attention and horrified by them. It's just saying like, oh yeah, right. it does sound like those thoughts are trying to trying to bug you. What what do you want to do, right? So kind of mm-hmm. helping them move towards their own values. So that's what I, you know, working with with kids. I wouldn't. I try to model confidence, right? Like we got this. We can handle it. Even if your inside face is like, oh my gosh, I don't know. It's like. That's okay. That's like being a parent, right? But outside we're modeling. Yeah, we got this. That's a good question. Let me think about that, right? And giving you some time to think about how you want to approach it, but just kind of being open and collaborative with them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I'm I'm making this course on um, anxiety skills. And the first section is how to not make anxiety worse. And then the the, the end chapter on it is like how to help someone else with anxiety. And the, the commandment is like, thou shalt not freak out. Like if someone else is anxious, like don't get anxious about their anxiety. Like it's okay. Like it's okay to have anxiety, like to feel this and experience this. Like don't freak out. It's okay. I feel like our society has this kind of a little bit narrower tolerance for discomfort right now. Like we want things to be comfortable. Like I can control the temperature in my house. I can control like driving to places instead of having to walk there. And it's like, I should be able to control my feelings. 
I shouldn't have to feel anxiety. And this is horrible if I do. And if I pass it on to my kids, they'd be better off not ever being born. And it's like, no, no, it's okay. Like, it's okay to experience this like broad spectrum of feels and live life too. Right. Yeah. I mean, cause kids are, all kids are going to feel all sorts of things. Yeah. Right. Intrusive okay. thoughts and fear and distress are just one of the things. And that may be something that your child experiences more of, and they may need some therapeutic support, right? You may need to encourage you to work with a qualified mental health professional who does work yeah. in intrusive thoughts and OCD and kind of work as a team, but there there's lots of things that can help, right? So I think we want to convey confidence and hope, and we can still be validating and understanding what we don't want. Uh, one of my favorite mentors that I had on fellowship, right? She would talk about like a fragile egg. She's like, we don't want to, she's like, do you know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing this. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not a fragile egg. <laughs> like they're, they're spunky. We got it. And I, I think it's about conveying like, you've got yeah. this, even though you absolutely have your own fears and worries right. about how it's going to go. That's okay. But I think conveying to them that, yeah, we got this. We're going to, we're going to move forward and, and always instilling hope. Yeah. Oh, and you just, you just, so I love that, right? Like just people can handle this. Like you can handle feeling anxiety and be okay. Like our culture talks about anxiety. When we talk about biopsychosocial, it's biology, psychology, and then our social environment contributes to how we think about OCD. And our, our environment is talking about, like our society talks about anxiety as if it's this horrific thing. There's this terrible disorder that if you feel anxiety, you have a terrible disorder. And some people do have anxiety disorders. I'm not trying to minimize that. But the way our society talks about it invites more fear instead of more normalization. When most most people, other than like psychopaths, most people experience anxiety as a normal yeah, part of their life. Yeah, it's what keeps us from running naked down the freeway, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> you worry about social repercussions, right? You worry about legal yeah. repercussions. You worry about getting hit by a car. I, I will yeah. often talk about people, talk to people about little A anxiety or big A anxiety, little D depression and big D depression, right? So yeah. understanding that, you know, we, there are anxiety disorders that are specific, mm-hmm. right? That we want to tackle and we have treatment approaches, but little A anxiety, like is just an emotion, like any of mm-hmm. the other emotions, right? Like it just, it, you know, deserves a part in, what is that movie? That Pixar movie. Oh, Sorry, inside no. out. Inside out. Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah. I was going through. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, so you just, you just brought up something that I want to touch on, even though we hadn't talked about this previously, but you, you mentioned, you know, working with a licensed mental health professional who's specifically who understands OCD. And I just want to like, one of the reasons for my audience, one of the reasons I'm interviewing Dr. Green is because I was not specifically trained in OCD treatment and I've studied it and I've read a couple books on it and I've gone to seminars on it, but there's a difference between like how the average kind of general therapist would treat an anxiety situation and how an OCD therapist, OCD informed therapist would, would treat that. And I would just say, like, I can speak for my half of the world in that when, when, people have kind of a general anxiety approach, they're going to talk to people about like, oh, let's challenge that thought. Oh, let's confront that thought. Oh, let's alter that thought. Oh, let's change that thought. And how would an OCD informed therapist treat an intrusive thought? (laughs) Uh, Or you could speak, you could probably speak a lot more to this and we're not trying to put down therapists. It's just that there are no, special. I think it's like I, I refer out all the time for things that I'm, yeah. I'm not. This is something you've, you've seen me do in, in trainings when I go to different groups. Like, you know, you're trained in MFT. I do not do couples therapy. <laughs> right? Like, oh, my gosh, yeah. I am not well suited to that. I'm not trained in it. I don't treat substance use. That's a specific, right. you know, specific informed area of training that I don't do. Right. I do right. trauma work within my specialty populations. Right. But I, mm-hmm. outside of that, unless there's no one else. Right. I, I refer out. So I, I don't think it's a put down to therapists at all. I think everyone has things that they've really developed competence in. Unfortunately, intrusive thoughts and OCD often go unrecognized. They're underdiagnosed. It can take, you know, 10 or 15 years for someone to say, oh, my gosh, that's what that is. I, I, I was I, I got this email from this girl in Pennsylvania, her mom, who was like, hey, my daughter has been my daughter has been seeing counselors for eight years. She's 15 now and she's terrified she's going to get kidnapped. 
and they have been treating her for social anxiety for X number of years. And I said, just, I, I can't diagnose over email and I'm not going to treat you over state lines, but have you considered an OCD, like an intrusive thoughts OCD the diagnosis? And she said, oh yeah, we looked into that. They said she doesn't have it. Well, two months later, she ends up in the psych hospital. She gets a good diagnosis. It was absolutely OCD, right? She was getting treated for social anxiety when it was OCD. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. had to interrupt there. But no, it happens all the time, happens right? All the time. I one of my first one of my first experiences kind of seeing this right because i'd been you know trained in ocd i had great supervisors but even early in my graduate training you know i i saw someone in you know very psychologically minded you know recognized what was going on with herself you know and was afraid of harming herself and other people and so previous therapists had explicitly told her it's not ocd like she had researched and said, I, I think this is what it is. And they said, no. And right. so she'd been, I mean, hospitalized unnecessarily. I mean, just so much distress around it. And then, you know, at the end of the interview, I was like, well, number one, you have OCD, right? So let's talk about what we do about that. And it's, even though it's like, okay, I don't, that's kind of overwhelming, but it feels like there's a, a path you can go, right? There's somewhere you can go from here. So to circle back around, I, I think, yeah, I think it's really important. I think especially I, I work a lot with with kids and teens, and I think that's another skill set, right? So you need to find someone that can do both, has experience doing both. I think with adults, finding someone who specifically works with OCD. I, I you know, you do some acceptance and commitment therapy. That's kind of a big part. Yeah, that's of kind of do. one of my my primary models. Yeah. So I I think more models, and more. Yeah. I think <laughs> you know, ACT ACT has much more of an approach similar to what exposure would be, right? Slightly different packaging, yeah. but the general approach is you know separating from the thought itself, and instead of challenging it and trying to beat it into submission, like mm -hmm. trying to change it, they've tried all that. Like if you've right. got a lot of intrusive thoughts, you've tried all those things. Right. So it's obviously it's not working. So it's taking a different approach with the thoughts where you're with the thoughts themselves, right? You're, you're just allowing them to kind of come and go. And then in, in exposure and response prevention therapy, you're, you're moving, you're kind of doing very specific behaviors. You're essentially inviting the party crasher over and then practicing living life the way you want to <laughs> without doing what it wants you to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, so it's, just, it's, a, but... mm -hmm, it's a different approach and it's evidence-based for OCD and, and intrusive thoughts in a way that a general therapist m might try to be helpful and be helpful in other areas, but not necessarily in a targeted way. In, in fact, general talk therapy, if you don't have someone who's doing, I mean, I would like to see everyone doing evidence-based work in general. That's a, that's a goal that I think we share. Kind of general talk therapy is often kind of directly harmful in OCD right. because it's it's giving yeah. the thoughts tons of attention and reassurance. And, you know, if you talk to someone who's not familiar with OCD and you're saying, oh my gosh, I, you know, I'm worried that I'm going to stab someone, you've got them either going, oh, you must be really violent, or yeah. they just spend the whole session sort of saying, no, you won't, no, you won't, no, you won't, which feels right. good in the moment, but the person leaves going, wait, I've tried telling myself that too. That doesn't work, right? It's mm -hmm. still here. So I think it's just needing to be mindful of kind of where your boundaries are and what your familiarity is, and then seeking out the training, you know, as you're trying to expand. Okay. You ready for the next thought? Ooh, I mean, the next ready. question, <laughs> we got three more. How can I not have intrusive thoughts during specific activities? Like Amorphous says, I have intrusive thoughts sometimes in the middle of meditating, which is counterproductive to the whole purpose of meditation. That's my favorite line. Is there a way to minimize the likelihood of it happening while I'm meditating? Thank you. <laughs> so here's the thing. No, because like intrusive thoughts are called intrusive thoughts because they're intruding. So I yeah. would expect them when you least want them. This is why people start withdrawing from activities that they know are going to trigger them, right? They start avoiding because they don't want to have anything to do with it. So no, you can't control when you have, in fact, they probably will get worse the more you try to control them. It's particularly relevant in the world of meditation because, you know, I'm not a good person to talk about meditation. Like it takes Either a lot way. of, my, it takes a lot of my energy and like my, all of my 
inhibition and executive functioning skills to like sit through exercises right where I'm sitting. But one of the things I hate is when we see, particularly on media, meditation portrayed as clear your mind. Right. And I'm like, they are human. How are you going to do that? Right. Like it's just, you can't clear your mind, right? You're, you're a verbal, verbal person. You've always got stuff. Some people are able to get to a point where, you know, maybe that is something they, they feel like they're in this very peaceful spot. But if you have a lot of intrusive thoughts, I wouldn't make it your life goal to be able to have a totally clear mind. That's probably not something that's going to happen or that is comfortable for you. So this is something that we're working towards saying, okay, how do I keep pushing through what I want to do? If I want to meditate, okay, the tantruming intrusive thought has to come with me. And eventually I expect that it may come and go. Maybe you'll have periods where it doesn't come at all. And then periods where it pops its head back in. But this is the, the kind of whole idea of intrusive thoughts is they're intruding, right? They're, they're uninvited. Yeah. They're going to show up when you don't want them the most. And you least want them. Yeah. Did I say that backwards? When they don't want them the most. Okay. So, so and the thing I thought that was interesting was like my understanding, I'm a terrible meditator as well. Like I just, it's so hard for me, <laughs> but my understanding of mindfulness is not that we're forcing, like you said, we're not forcing our, our mind to go to a blank slate. It's rather we're getting better at noticing, like just stepping back a little bit and being more aware of our thoughts without becoming attached to them, without making meaning about them, without labeling them as horrific or terrible or good or bad or awesome or great or comfortable. Right. So when I, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, maybe step away from meditation and practice a little bit more of the mindfulness, the basics Mm -hmm. of mindfulness. Well, especially if that's something that you're drawn towards, right? Some of these Eastern traditions that where we have our roots in this mindfulness, I think that's a great approach. Like if that's something that you really value, I think you pursue it, but something like mindfulness may kind of set you up a little better Mm -hmm. to do the intrusive thought piece. Yeah, I, I would say so. But maybe that's just because I'm a terrible meditator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it normal to have intrusive thoughts or worries about other specific events besides those listed in the course? So this includes things like social anxiety, a breakup, or trying to solve a problem. Yeah, so I saw this come up a lot. And I, I tried to, I mean, obviously, I intrusive thoughts is most often associated with OCD, right? When we're talking about this, but the truth is in any anxiety, and I tried to speak to this in the course as well, like a lot of worries are intrusive, right? They're intrusive, they're persistent, they're unwanted, they're uninvited. So I, even though there's some distinct characteristics about OCD, I think it's helpful to, to think about lots of different things. You know, if it's something that it's showing up unannounced, uninvited. It's, you know, vying for attention and control. It's trying to take you away from things that you value, right? Using fear tactics or those kind of things. I, I think you yeah. can think about it as, as intrusive thoughts. So I think, you know, social anxiety, I think one of the questions was like thinking about how things went at a party the night before. Like, absolutely, right? That's the party crasher showing up like, oh my gosh, did you see the look on their face? And why did you say that thing that way? And you sound so weird, right? Like these are, it's just kind of, they want you to go into a corner and just replay it and rehash it over and over and over just to make sure that you're as weird as you thought you were. Like, yes, it's the same kind of thing. (laughs) If you're kind of prone to intrusive thoughts, it may be a, a breakup that kind of sticks around. Although I'll say like things like a breakup may stick around for anyone, regardless of the anxiety, right? There, there may be some yeah. replaying involved just as part of the normal process. Mm-hmm. Like it might just be like, oh, it's just normal to think about these painful experiences yeah. and your brain to kind of roll them over, try and work through them or. or yeah, not. And, yeah. We don't have to pathologize that necessarily. Like that doesn't Absolutely. mean you're disordered. Like it might just be Absolutely. your brain doing its thing. Yeah. All of this is just your brain doing its thing, right? <laughs> that's it. That's all the questions I've got. All right. Well, that's, I mean, I appreciated all the questions. I thought they were really interesting. And I'm, again, I'm hoping the course addresses kind of the big hitters. But I mean, obviously, if there's others that come up after people finish the course, and they're like, hey, this, you know, there's specifics. I'm happy to talk more about those or post stuff, whatever's helpful. Yeah. So if you guys, for those of you in the audience or those of you taking the course, please um, go ahead and leave some more questions if you have them down in the uh, comments below. And we'll try to get them addressed as well if, if more of them come up. So 
yeah thank you so much um for taking the time cat to talk with us and share your expertise really appreciate it yeah happy to be here okay well take care everyone <laughs>